Hello and welcome, dear viewer, to the second video in the three-part flag series. Today, I'm actually concerning myself with what makes flag tick and how it does its compression. Note that the first video, you can watch that up here, was just an introduction to digital audio. So if you haven't seen it and you know all of these terms, then you should be good to go. Last time, we saw how we can take a sound wave and represent it literally with numbers, which is called pulse code modulation. If you want to go the short route for storing the audio data, you can of course take these PCM samples and throw them into your file as is. If you did that, you would get the wave format. But as I mentioned in the first video, the file sizes here get large fast. Simple math tells us that there are about 1.4 megabits of sample data for each second. However, FLAC can commonly compress this to about half the size, 600 kilobits per second or even less. We can go further and reach for 150 kilobits with MP3, but we're here for lossless compression. Today I want to dig deep so it's easy to lose track of what we're trying to do and what we have done so far. Therefore, let's look at the sidebar once in a while, just to keep the big picture in mind. The key to all kinds of compression is patterns. Last time I demonstrated how repeats in data can be easily removed with basic compression. Now, if you were to look at this audio data, there is no obvious repetition here. But remember that no matter how random this looks, we're still dealing with sound. And sound is made up of waves, whose defining feature is that they repeat. But what are these waves actually? I didn't mention it in the last episode because it wasn't relevant, but the most basic kind of wave is a sine wave. The mathematical function takes parameters that modify the amplitude, frequency, phase and offset of the wave. In fact, it's the case that any sound can be described just by the basic sine waves it is made out of. Now you might have a first idea of how to store the samples. Check what sine waves constitute this signal, then just store sine waves and their parameters. That's a great idea, in fact you're about to reinvent MP3 in the discrete sine transform. But for FLAC we won't see much of a benefit. The number of frequencies we need to store is extremely large. It's so large that we need just as much data as for the samples themselves. And sine waves are rather expensive to compute. So let's use something simpler. How about a polynomial function? A quick refresher on high school calculus. A monomial is any function like these, where the parameter x is taken to an integer power and multiplied by a coefficient, and a polynomial is just adding a bunch of monomials. Linear functions, constant functions or quadratic functions, they are all polynomials. If we consider the coefficients again, there is only one coefficient per x term. So a function of degree 5 meaning 5 is the highest power of x, can only have 6 coefficients. Don't forget x to the power of 0, the constant term. But we need to take a step back. We want to approximate waves, which are sine functions. Polynomials are nothing like sine functions, at least not out of the box. Some of you already are guessing where I'm going with this, so let me tell you about one of the most amazing things in calculus. Like sine itself, on the one hand we have a lot of weird functions in math. On the other hand we have the super simple polynomial functions. So how about we approximate a complicated function, any function, with a polynomial? For starters we pick a point x0 on the function where the approximation is centered so to speak. Then our approximated function t should of course have the same value as the original function in that point. And then t should probably have the same derivative in x0 as f does, so that its slope is the same. And then t should probably have the same second derivative in x0 as f does, so that its curve is the same. 
and so on as long as you want to. If you're curious about how we get this formula, watch the linked video, I don't have time right now. The gist is that especially for functions that can be derived a lot, the approximation with a polynomial is really good. In the case of sine and cosine, in fact, arbitrarily good. These formulas here are just what we get when we put in the well-known values and derivatives of sine and cosine. The function t we just created is called the Taylor series of f, and it's one of the most powerful numeric tools in existence. In our case, we just need to know this. It's very possible to approximate an audio wave closely with a polynomial. But I have again kind of lied to you. Sure, we can approximate the audio wave with a polynomial, and we can tune how close we get by choosing what degree the polynomial is. But this kind of approximation breaks down very fast with more than a handful of samples. The required polynomial degrees would be extremely large, which is expensive and unstable on all fronts. Let's try to improve things. I kind of skipped over it, but we're of course not in discrete real number math land. All our numbers are discrete and finite, both in x and y. This means that we're not dealing with approximating a function with a function, we're approximating a series with a series, or rather, a digital signal with a digital signal. As long as we keep our signal defined like this, however, we're just switching up the notation, nothing actually changes practically speaking. The magic only happens once we use a recursive definition. You might have heard about recursion before, and here we just mean that we define a signal's value as a combination of previous signal values. Recursion is not super common in the kind of calculus you learn in school, but it turns out to be a powerful tool for data compression. Now you have to briefly take my word and believe me that these specific recursive signal definitions are really great. What does this notation mean? The sample at position t is specified to be two times the sample at position t minus one minus the sample at position t minus two. Therefore, if we already know the previous samples, we can compute the next sample very easily. But what if we don't yet know the previous samples? That's a problem all recursive definitions need to solve. There has to be a non-recursive starting point. More formally, there is an infinite number of non-recursive functions that fulfill this recursive formula. We take the easiest way out and say that the first couple of samples have some constant values. How many constant samples simply depends on how many previous samples our formula asks for. So let's revisit the procedure and introduce some terminology. Out of the four different orders, we are given one predictor as well as the warm-up samples. The order specifies how many samples we need to look back. So how many constant warm-up samples we need. For the first couple of samples, we don't use the recursive predictor formula, only afterwards. Not only is this extremely cheap to compute, it's also super space efficient. Because there's only one predictor per order, we just store the order instead of the coefficients themselves. And at the same time, the order tells us how many warm-up samples there are. What we're doing here is encoding samples by predicting what the next sample will be based on a linear combination of the previous samples. That's why we call it linear predictive coding. You remember how you took my word a minute ago when I said that you have to believe in the greatness of these specific predictors? Well, let's get to why that is. LPC does not always result in polynomial functions, in fact, most of the time it doesn't. And even though it doesn't look like it from the seemingly arbitrary coefficients, these predictors here are the only ones of their order that do actually correspond to a polynomial function. It's not magic, it's math. Let's look at this from another angle. We have a number of samples that were already decoded, and we now want to predict what the next sample will be. How can we do that? Let's take the simplest approach first and try to use a line. In math, of course, we call that a linear function or a polynomial of degree one. So 
we want to insert a line somewhere here and the prediction we make is where the line intersects the sample's point in time which we call t. A linear function consists of only two parameters, the slope and the vertical position, but we want to recursively define them depending on the previous samples. First, let's ignore the slope. I challenge you to come up with a position for the sample t. Your solution is probably too complicated. Let's do this as simple as possible and use the previous sample. We can think of the previous sample as our starting point, just something to go off from. Now what about the slope? Think about what we just did with the position, we simply copied it. So how about we copy the slope too? The best slope to use, of course, is the slope between the previous two samples. If you took any amount of calculus, you know that this slope can be calculated by dividing the y difference by the x difference. Lucky for us, the x difference is 1 and the y difference is the difference between these two samples. Now, shifting the slope triangle to the right so that it starts at the previous sample shows us where we predict the next sample to be. In terms of our formula, we add the slope to the position. And that's already the second order predictor. Note that the very last step only works because all the samples have the same distance, so the x portion of the slope triangle is always 1. This assumption of a distance of 1 is one we generally make because it doesn't really change anything but it simplifies the math. Now that you have seen how we can come up with a formula for the simple case, let me show you a more formal mathematical method. This is less intuitive but more robust and we can use it for even the very highest predictor orders. Our starting point again are the Taylor polynomials. Remember, the fundamental assumption behind Taylor is that we can approximate some unknown input by adding up the function and its derivatives at a known input. For the best accuracy, let's pick the last decoded sample as our known input. For the function's value itself, that's of course just this sample, but we don't even know the first derivative. After all, we don't actually know the underlying function, we can't derive it with calculus. Instead, we have to approximate the derivative as well, and we're gonna use Taylor once more. First, we need to decide how many samples we want to use to approximate the derivative. You can use arbitrarily many, and for reasons outside the scope here, that will give you better and better approximations. However, just know that we need at least two samples for the first derivative, at least three samples for the second derivative, and so on. So for us, let's just choose the sample at t-1, which we're dealing with anyways, and the one before that, t-2. To make it simple, our assumption will be that we can calculate the discrete derivative at t-1 by some linear combination of the known samples at t-1 and t-2. Alright, and this might seem arbitrary at first. Let's write both those samples, not as the actual value they are, but how we could in theory calculate them by a Taylor approximation from t-1. And then, Let's plug that into the right side of the linear combination. Do you see now? If I write the left hand side more explicitly and rearrange the right side, it might be a bit more obvious. We have coefficients for both the sample and its derivative on both sides. And that means in order for this formula to be correct, all the corresponding coefficients need to be equal. And that gives us a linear systems of equations containing a and b as the unknowns. Luckily, this system is super easy to solve and we get a equals 1 and b equals minus 1. Plug that back into the very first equation and we have an approximation for the derivative. Not too bad, was it? Of course, the steps quickly get out of hand once we try the same thing for higher order derivatives. However, the procedure is exactly the same, you just have longer expansions and more equations in the system. I encourage you to try doing the second derivative yourself. Remember, we need the previous three samples, and if you know a thing or two about linear systems of equations, you should be able to tell why that is. Finally, 
we need to invoke Taylor once more and just combine these derivatives into one formula for the sample we actually care about. There's a trade-off here. Using more derivatives gives us a better approximation. That's just a basic property of Taylor polynomials. On the other hand, higher derivatives require more samples and more time to compute. So, depending on how much accuracy we need, we can select 0 to 3 derivatives and simplifying these equations gives us exactly the 5 predictors we know from before. Of course, if you've been calculating the Taylor expansions along at home, these formulas aren't correct, some of the higher derivatives are missing a factor. That is indeed intentional. We're not doing exact math, we're just trying to do some sample prediction to compress audio. Avoiding the factorial divisors makes this entire thing cheaper to compute, which, you remember, was the whole point of linear predictive coding. Two remarks before we continue. First, it is important to remember that this whole polynomial prediction business only applies at the level of the few previous samples. We're not, in fact, trying to approximate all of the samples with just one polynomial. That is never a good idea. And second, in general, when we're talking about linear predictive coding, the coefficients here can be anything. The resulting function is then not a polynomial anymore, but it turns out that many of them are even better at signal prediction than the five simple ones we initially looked at. So, of course, FLAG supports them. The highest order we can go to is 32. I have to mention, though, that this is extremely computationally intensive, especially for encoding. Choosing predictor order and coefficients for arbitrary LPC involves just way too much linear algebra. On the other hand, the polynomial predictors are so cheap that you can just encode with all five of them and pick the one that compresses best. Now, remember that LPC contains the word predictive. It's predicting the sample values, not exactly reproducing them. This means that no matter how hard we try, there will always be an error. If we subtract the predicted signal from the actual signal, we get something called the residual. A list of numbers, once again. You might say now that all this linear predictive coding didn't gain us much if we're still left with these numbers that need to be included. Remember, it's lossless. At this point, we could invent the free lossy audio codec and throw away most of the information. But that's not today's topic. We need all of the data here. Recall that in the previous step, we didn't store separate data for most samples. Well, that turns out to not work very well here. I'll go ahead and assume that we need to store all residuals independent of each other. The first idea would of course be to pick a bit depth, probably something similar to the original bit depth, and just encode the residuals with that. And we're not totally off base here. FLAC allows you to go that route if everything else fails. You have to be careful with what bit depth you choose, as all the residuals have to fit, but it's totally possible. Though as the astute among you have already noticed, this is super non-efficient. Let's think of a very simple but common scenario. We have a very good approximation of our original samples, so all of our residuals are very small in magnitude, like plus or minus 32 at maximum. But there are these few samples towards the end that do not fit our curve at all, and their residual size is ridiculously large, like a couple thousand. So just to fit those few outliers, we immediately need a bit depth of say 10 to 12, which wastes a lot of bits on the small numbers. An insight we need here is some information theory fundamentals. 3Blue1Brown One Brown made an excellent video on the matter, so I'll keep it brief. What I implicitly already told you is a very important observation about the residual data. Because they are residuals from a function approximation, most values are pretty small. To put it another way, if you are reading through the list of residuals at random, the probability of hitting any specific value is not equal. You are more likely to encounter small values than large values. So a good encoding scheme should use very little space to store common small values 
and it can be allowed to use a bit of excessive space for uncommon large values. As I said, a constant bit depth is out. What about a variable bit depth? If we can specify how many bits a number uses, we can choose lower bit depths for smaller numbers and larger bit depths for larger numbers. So let's have two numbers. One specifies the bit depth and the other is the encoded value itself at that bit depth. This sounds like a good idea, but it's not efficient. We have only moved our problem because now we need to pick and choose another meta bit depth for the bit depth specifier. Our maximum meta bit depth still needs to support the very large bit depth required for the very large numbers. All in all, we don't gain much. The bit depth specifier needs to have a variable size as well. The simplest method is to use unary encoding. In unary, a number is simply represented by the number of symbols that are present, tally marks. In computers, which only store binary, we need a terminating symbol. So we use zeros followed by a single one. And yes, that means that there is one symbol more than the number we store. This is intentional and will come in handy later. Getting back to the encoding, we can then place the number itself after that. Except all numbers start with a one in binary, so we don't need to store that one again. The unary encoded bit depth can then be thought of as the highest power of two in the number. So to encode, count the bits in the number and store that many zeros. Then store the number itself starting with the highest one bit. To decode, read zeros until you hit a one, then keep reading afterwards as many bits as there were zeros. The decoded number is the second half as well as the leading one. This encoding scheme is known as Elias Gamma Coding and it's already great. I mean, it's good enough for Pokemon Gen 1 sprites. But we still have two major drawbacks that need fixing. First, Gamma Coding can't encode a zero. This is easy enough to fix. We just add one to the number before encoding it and subtract that one after decoding. This method has its own name, the Exponential Gulomb Code. Second, however, the encoded size is a problem. We can encode arbitrarily sized numbers with gamma coding, but the required bits are always double of what the number would need in isolation. Small numbers don't mind this, but large numbers do. So here's the procedure. We pick a parameter k, which is called the order of the exponential Gulomb code. Order 0 will give us what we previously discussed and higher orders give us better encoding of larger numbers but worse encoding of smaller numbers. We're encoding any number now as a multiple of a base plus a remainder. Our base is always the kth power of 2, that's the exponential part. The great thing is that in binary, multiplying or dividing by a power of 2 is just shifting bits around. So by splitting the number up into a multiple of a power of 2 plus a remainder when dividing by that power of 2, we just literally split the bits of the number into two parts. We encode the quotient with order 0 exponential Gulomb coding, which is what we discussed beforehand. Then afterwards, we append the remainder, which per construction always uses exactly k bits. When I first understood this coding, it was magical. Let's take a moment to appreciate what this is doing. We're still making use of all the efficient fun stuff, like variable bit depth for arbitrarily large numbers. But the k gives us a fixed number of lower bits that are included as is, while we perform exponential Gulomb coding only on the upper more significant bits. Critically, we don't increase the bit count by 2 when we double the number as the lower bits have nothing to do with the coding of the upper bits. As we increase k, we get a larger number of fixed low bits, which is quite expensive for small numbers. But for large numbers, the encoding of the upper bits allows us to reach ridiculous values without the double cost from before. Again, we can now pick the trade-off. If our residuals are good and we only have a few large numbers, we choose k very small or even zero, 
leading to very good small number compression. If our residuals are bad, we choose a larger K and can still compress data while not paying double the price for large numbers. FLAC recognizes that even within a single list of residuals, there are many different collections of residuals that need differing treatment. So, you can actually choose up to 32,768 different orders for a single residual list. And if any chunk of residuals compresses badly, you just don't compress it. The observant viewers might have noticed that we still have a problem. All the numbers that exponential Coulomb can encode are positive, but residuals as all audio data are signed, so both positive and negative. It's a similar situation to how we didn't have zero in Elias gamma coding. But again, there is a simple fix. If we just store positive and negative numbers alternatingly, we can make numbers of small magnitude map to few bits and keep our good properties. More specifically, we map negative x to minus 2x minus 1 and non-negative x to 2x. Let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. So far we have only concerned ourselves with one stream of audio, one list of samples and one channel. But the reality is that most audio has at least two channels, stereo of course. And it would be really wasteful to just encode both channels independently. After all, most stereo audio has very similar or even the same audio on both the left and right channels. So what we can do instead is interchannel decorrelation. Instead of a left and right channel, we use a mid and side channel. The mid channel stores the average of the two channels, while the side channel stores the difference between the channels. To decode, we just use mid plus side for the left channel and mid minus side for the right channel. All of this is per sample, of course, which means that the mid and side channels are what actually passes through our LPC and residual shenanigans. The big advantage is now that the side channel is usually very silent or in fact perfectly silent. Therefore, it can usually be compressed extremely well all in all amounting to not much more than just compressed mono data. And that's it for today. This is all that FLAC does to compress audio. Let's revisit what we learned today because it's a lot. First, audio channels are decorrelated if needed. Then, we approximate a channel's data with linear predictive coding and will often use a polynomial predictor. We store the coefficients of the LPC, as well as the warm-up, and treat the difference between encoded and actual signal as the residual. The residual is then encoded with an exponential Coulomb code of arbitrary order. Here I want to end the second video. You now understand all the theory behind FLAX audio compression, but in the final video I want to look at how that works in practice.